This is Fresh Shed, a weekly podcast that makes complex ideas in educational research easily understood. I'm your host, Will Brim. Today, we air the next episode of Flux, a Fresh Ed series where graduates turn their research interests into narrative-based podcasts. This episode was created by Isadine Anwar, who recently graduated with his PhD from Oxford and is now a lecturer in education at Keele University. In his Flux episode, Isadine problematizes the meaning of development. Is it always a forward motion? Or does it weave side to side like a river? And how does development get written onto our lives? Is it always bad? Is it always good? Isadine meanders through these questions, connecting family memory to the development of Malaysia. I hope you enjoy the show. The photo is slightly out of focus. The colors seem rosy. My grandfather, To, is sitting at his desk, intently writing something as he is captured in profile. His dark blue collared shirt is tucked into a checkered white and grey sarong. His toes are pressed neatly on the linoleum flooring. Dark green with geometric patterns, his heels raised in the air. A stack of books covers the far end of the table, and on the shelves in front of him are small boxes lined neatly against the wall. Cigarettes? Matchboxes? A calendar hangs on the wall. I must ask someone what year this photo was taken. Where was Ma at this time? How long still until I was born? So many questions. Do was a government school teacher. I think Do was an agent of development, bringing progress across the land. In the wake of independence from the British in 1957, mass education became crucial for nation-building and industrialization in the newly post-colonial Malaysia. Teachers like To, employed by the government, served as implementing agents all over the country. Where was To teaching at this time? I turned to Ma, his daughter, my mother, for more insights. Tu mula-mula dia mula sekali dia mengajar di sekolah kebangsaan Kampung Gua dekat Padang Tengku daerah Lipis. Chronologically, Ma is recounting the names of schools where Tu served throughout his career. She lists the names of places Kampung Gua, Tanjung Gahai, where he met my grandmother Wan. Dia bertukar ke sekolah daerah uh, Ulu Temeling. Ha, lepas Ulu Temeling, dia dia bertukar balik semula ke daerah Lipis tu sekolah kebangsaan Kuala Medang. Lepas mengajar sekolah Kuala Medang. After he married one, Tok moved to Ulu Temeling, teaching at a few schools. Then Kuala Medang, then back to Tanjung Gahai, and finally Padang Tengku, where he retired. Bertukar pula ke sekolah kebangsaan Padang Tengku. Selama 15 tahun kat situ sehinggalah dia bersara. I am thinking about Do and Ma, about time and place. I want to follow their stories, braid them with my own. Remember Do, a hovering phantom, by following our stories, by tracing them as they flow across three generations along the river of development. From one generation to the next, like the river Jelai that flows beside To and Mark's homes, once our bathing pool, these stories cling to our skin. I am trying to melawan lupa, to resist the act of forgetting, to keep To alive somehow. So I turn to my own memories of To, to Mark's memories of To, to my own memories of Mark. Generational memories. These stories are rooted in histories that are specific to my family, but they are also situated 
in Malaysia's broader story of becoming. Our stories across three generations are also Malaysia's stories of development, of progress. I remember that there used to be no phone signal in this area. Now we connect to Facebook and send WhatsApp messages as if we always could, as far back as we remember. Before we had to leave the car on the other side of the river and take a boat across to Tho's house, I was always scared of falling in the deep water, of drowning. And now we drive our car across a two-lane concrete bridge and reach Tho's house seamlessly without having to switch from a car to a boat and without having to think about drowning. The river Jalai is murkier now. It's color like a thick milk tea. There's no thought of playing in those waters anymore. There is a certain rhythm to the music you can hear in the background, like a current that sweeps you gently forward. My eldest brother, Long, the first grandchild in our family, composed the music, and that is him that you can hear playing the guitar. I, I remember that there was a photo of him as a young man, as a young teacher, and underneath it was written, Ahmad Black. Again, I'm not sure whether I'm imagining this or I think it actually exists that you can find the photo somewhere so I was imagining that oh what if uh, this Ahmad Black was actually Tok's kind of um, that, because he was travelling throughout rural Pahang often of course at that time by the rivers right, using the river as a mean of transportation but he was travelling around because he was teaching so I was imagining that in addition to being a teacher he was some sort of a kind of chronicler uh, someone who was chronicling you know uh, obscure rural Pahang through this persona of, of Ahmad Black. Uh, so imagining him as, as a kind of a, you know, like a blues musician or something like that, somehow carrying a guitar, uh, walking around, uh, you know, in the depths of Ulu Pahang and, and making these songs which are evocative of that, that kind of locality. The photo is slightly out of focus. The colors seem rosy. I was always sitting by his desk uh, next to the window, and I remember if you go back Bali Kampong, if you enter the house on the front, uh, if you open the door, he's, he's usually always there sitting, uh, you know, writing at his desk. He's always writing and making notes, you know, and, and, and his, his notebooks and his journal are very neat. Being the eldest grandchild, Long was the closest to Tho among the grandchildren. I remember those hot monsoon afternoons of our childhood, all the windows thrown open to catch the breeze. Long would lay on the floor with Tho in his room, both of them reading aloud from historical and religious texts. Atuk mempunyai tempat pilihannya suatu bercerita. Di atas tikar, di tengah rumah, berdekatan dengan tiang seri. Together, their voices floated through that house on stilts as the rest of us dozed off, exhausted from the morning spent running around the vast compound. Tok's house rests on a plot of land passed down from one generation to the next, in a village called Tanjung Gahai, a settlement on a prominent bend of the river Jelai that flows into the district of Kuala Lipis, the colonial capital of the state of Pahang from 1898 to 1955, before it was moved eastward to Kuantan to face the South China Sea. The state of Pahang is the largest and probably the most primitive state of the Malay Peninsula, rolling plains of elephant grass, thousands of square miles of almost impenetrable jungle, sluggish rivers canopied by the interlaced tops of forest giants, rain-drenched nights and the roar of a man-eating tiger. Pahang is described in 1938 by Willard C. Bush, the quote-unquote Mad Yank manager of two rubber plantations, a white man's mythologizing of the landscapes that Do, Ma 
and I inhabit across time. Willard C. Bush's narrative is a conquest narrative, a frontier narrative. Are Bush's memories of Pahang more or less valid than mine? Should I reject them completely as those of a lone white man in possession of an orientalist gaze? Let me rewrite this narrative of a wild, impenetrable country with my descriptions of the Pahang that I know based on my own memories and experiences. The state of Pahang is the largest and probably the lushest state of the Malay Peninsula. Rolling plains of elephant grass, the elephant is taken as a symbol of state pride. Mat recalls a moment when To and my grandmother Wan were clearing their farmland to replant rubber saplings. While resting, one suddenly encounters an elephant, each startled by the sight of the other, and she hollers out for To. With his gun, To shoots into the air to drive away the lone elephant. Thousands of square miles of verdant jungle supplying the fresh air we breathe and the natural symphony of critters. Meandering rivers canopied by the interlaced tops of forest giants provide connection and resources for living along its tributaries and deltas. Rain-drenched, cool nights bring restful slumber. These might be hopeful, even romantic descriptions. Part of it is wishful or magical thinking on my end especially in the context of so-called progress in Malaysia, which brings with its riches monsoon floods, deforestation, and extinction. Stories of the roar of the Malayan tiger are passed down across generations, a big cat venerated on the country's coat of arms. Mat tells me about my great-grandmother, Moyang. One day, while Moyang was gardening late in the afternoon, she hears the roar of a tiger on the other side of the river. Hastily, Moyang packed up and shifted to her brother's house on higher ground. Those were the days when the other side of the river was thick jungle with hardly any human settlements. Hearing the story today makes it sound like a myth. Malayan tigers that numbered upwards of 3,000 in the 1950s, mostly in the state of Pahang, have dwindled to less than 150 today, their habitat lost to agriculture projects. Today, Malaysia is one of the most urbanized countries in Southeast Asia. In the urban capital of Kuala Lumpur, towers of commerce pierce the heavens, beacons of wealth and technological prowess. Pembangunan sebagai bangunan, development translated as the construction of buildings. High-rise condominiums are the embodiment of development projects, densely packed, almost uniform in their aesthetics of glass, concrete, and steel. Highways and flyovers skirt and snake throughout the city. They carry cars that bleat and bump in congested traffic, rushing towards the next destination. When it rains in the afternoons, the waters rise in a flash, trapping the part-time inhabitants who are eager to leave at the end of office hours. The city comes to a standstill. Nature takes her revenge. Malaysia's National Laureate Usman Awang speaks to the perils of development on the environment at the edge of the city through this poem titled Balada Terbunuhnya Beringin Tua di Pinggir Sebuah Kota, 
translated as the ballad of the death of an old fig tree at the edge of a city. The tree meets its demise due to its enemy, a plan called Pumbangunan, the Malay term for development. The tree sings its swan song. Does progress only happen by moving forward from the past into the future, out of a quote-unquote primitive state into one that advances ahead, out of a state of nature towards a state of glass and steel, towards towers that scrape the sky? Is progress more complex? Could progress also happen by turning back, by exploring a bend in the river, by Malawan Lupa, returning to a past one fears losing? Although Tho passed away ten years ago, we continue to remember him as a central figure in our lives. Long composes acoustic tracks, Ma tells and retells stories. I have dreams about Tho. He slips into my subconscious, almost becoming real again. There's this dream I have, not while sleeping. Maybe it's a childlike hope, a projection. Tho is still alive, still out there somewhere on a long journey on foot. Much longer than those walks we took when I was younger accompanying him to Aki Akko's house for a haircut. One day, he will return, appearing in the doorway to the kitchen. Then we'll realize he is still, has been, here all along. The photo is slightly out of focus. The colors seem rosy. Gambar ni Tok dia kat meja kerja dia Masa ni dia mengajar di sekolah kebangsaan Padang Tengku Tok is at his work desk During this time he was teaching at the primary school in Padang Tengku This desk is where he does his work Updating his teaching logbook Marking students workbooks Doing some writing This house is at the teacher's quarters in Padang Tengku Dia pakai kain Kain plekat dengan t-shirt warna hitam. He is wearing a checkered sarong Selang with a black t-shirt. Kain plekat je lah. This is his usual attire at home. Ras, rasanya lah ni tahun tahun 70-an. Ha, tahun 70-an ni gambar ni. Mak thinks this photo was taken in the 70s when she was in the local secondary school. Maybe circa 1971 or 72. Masih sekolah menengah rendah. I think Ma is an agent of development, bringing progress across the land. In the 1980s, after bouts of secondary and tertiary education, a young woman secured a job working as a technician in a regional development project called Dara, meaning virgin, in southeast Pahang. There, she was part of a team that explored the frontier, developing a million hectares of land south of the Pahang River, turning thick jungle into agricultural land and housing. She lived in a place called Bukit Ibam. It is in Bukit Ibam that the young woman gave birth to a son in 1988 
and as her time with the project came to a close, she migrated to the nation's capital of Kuala Lumpur to be absorbed by the Federal Department of Works. The paths of the daughter, now a mother, and the son intersect in a project called Progress. The river of development continues to flow from one generation to the next. Its waters pass down from Ma to me over time, carrying me on my way. But where is this river taking me? I think I am an agent of development, bringing progress across the land. After studying engineering like Ma, a subconscious parallel, I was employed by the national oil company Petronas that funded my higher education. Like Ma, I too served the master that paid for my tertiary education. I worked for a national company that built riches by extracting and processing natural gas and petroleum. To do this, oil platforms were constructed in the ocean, bolted to the seabed. Traditional seaside villages were displaced and cleared to make way for large-scale petrochemical complexes. The night sky lit up constantly as excess gas is burned off. Forests were raised despite protests from indigenous peoples so that lines and lines of gas pipes could snake through them like roots, like veins connecting an energy network that served as the country's lifeblood of economy and prosperity. At the same time, the company has become a source of national pride, represented concretely by the Petronas Twin Towers, standing tall in the middle of the commercial capital, Kuala Lumpur. I remember watching the live on, t- on television when they lifted the bridge uh, that connects the two towers in, in place, right? Uh, and I was like, whoa, like, like somehow uh, we've made it. You know? like as a country, we now have the tallest building in the world. Uh, but then as I studied architecture, and as you become more and more critical of what is built around you and, and of why things are built, I guess I became a bit more skeptical of the whole thing. You know? the, the idea of the Twin Towers is that you're always looking up, you don't realize the kind of poverty and the reality on ground is forgotten when you're always looking up at at the top of the Twin Towers. During my stint with this organization, I was part of the team tasked to deliver corporate philanthropy projects in education. I guess I feel a bit torn. I mean, I'm so grateful that I received funding from the organization to go to university. And in return, I worked for the organization and got to learn a lot about education on the many visits to rural schools that I took part in. We funded school reform and vocational programs, gave out back-to-school items, organized science camps. At the same time, we combed through our press releases to make sure they stated how much we had helped the country. How many scholarships, how many schools adopted, how many partners on the ground, how much money was invested. Was this development? Or was this merely a cynical PR stunt? Five years. That is how long I served with the National Oil Company. What kind of work would I do next? And I wondered if it would matter more than what I had left behind. Where would the river carry me? In 2017, I arrived at the University of Oxford and enrolled in a master's degree in comparative and international education. Eventually, I stayed in the academy and enrolled in a PhD program. The cool, misty mornings. The rolling hills backdropping the school compound. The sleepy town a short drive away. There, I trailed the future and was reminded of my own past, of my own schooling days 15 years prior. Finding myself once more at a rural school this time as a researcher, not as an agent for the oil company, felt like deja vu, but not quite. What's different this time around? Time, I guess. As a researcher, I wanted to be less hasty, less touch and go, less concerned about the best PR angle, 
This time, I told myself, I can spend a few months in this place. Maybe there's a chance that I'll learn something more compared to those work trips. I take my time, but there's so much more time ahead. The generation that will outlast me. These young people who will invent the future. I will have to let go, though I try hard not to forget. I am listening. I am learning. States like Johor, the school that are using tampering. For example, some people are happy when they are rich. As they describe their aspirations to me, the young people here are looking outwards, yearning for something more. They speak of spending time with family, of happiness, of their care for the environment. Like these young people, I too enjoyed bathing in the river in my teenage years. River Jelai. I close my eyes and recall the green translucent waters, the swathes of sand under my feet, the sculptures of driftwood in mysterious shapes. We tread on common ground, the young people and I, even if only in my mind. Ma moved back permanently to her ancestral hometown in Kampung Tanjung Gahai after she retired in 2014, living in a house designed by Long, next to Tok's house. It seems that the river doesn't always carry us to the city uh, as our final destination. Ma feels it has been too long that she lived in Kuala Lumpur. The traffic jams, the hustle and bustle was becoming too much. Growing up, she recalled a big flood had happened only once in 1971. But now, in her era of retirement, a big flood hit the newly built home in 2014 and then once more, recently, in 2021. There is grief in encountering the flood in old age. But now that she knows what to expect, the grief is tempered. She endures the elements, and she is ready. One generation to the next. Three generations along the river of development, never flowing in a single direction. Turning back, seeking roots, memories, and connections. Even if the tides are dangerous, imperfect, and uneasy. Even if the tides are no longer familiar, predictable, and welcoming. Today's episode was created, written, produced, and edited by Izadine Anuar. Johanna Fay was the executive producer, and Brett Lashua and Will Brem were the producers. The acoustic guitar compositions were performed by Ahmed Black. Special thanks to Nazmi Anuar, Ahmed Akif, and Norani Ahmed, as well as the students of SMK Padang Midden School. Flux theme music was by Joseph Monadio of Pattern Based Music. Full credits can be found in the show notes. A transcript with a selection of resources for further exploration can be found at freshedpodcast.com. 
Please note that opinions expressed on Fresh Ed are solely those of the host or the guest interviewed, not Fresh Ed, which takes no institutional position. If you've liked what you've heard today, please rate us wherever you listen to podcasts. Reviews really do help. Fresh Ed's team includes Sherry Yang, Fati Octus, Oba Femi Ungunle, Dion Jiang, Annabella Afrobotang, Anya Lin, Phyllis J. Mensa, and Jose Neto. Fresh Ed is an independently run podcast without advertisements and is made possible by the support of the Open Society Foundations, the UCL Institute of Education, NORAG, the Shock Dev Family Fund, and listeners like you. Please consider donating to Fresh Ed by visiting freshedpodcast.com slash donate. Thanks for listening. I'm Will Brem, and I'll be back next week.